She is currently the 30th chair of the Council of Economic Advisors. <laughs> uh, prior to that, she served as Dean of Princeton School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, she first joined the faculty at Princeton after completing her PhD in economics from Harvard. And uh, she is one of the defining figures in the development of the subfield of the economics of education. She holds the Lawrence and Shirley Katzman and Lewis and Anna Ernst professorship, that's a long <laughs> name, right? in, in the economics of education at Princeton. Uh, she has one of the most spectacular citation counts you've ever seen. And uh, the breadth of her work ranges from issues like the IQ controversy, uh, she uh, did a twin study associated mm -hmm. with trying to identify returns from schooling. She's done work on class size and student performance. Uh, she's probably done the most important work in terms of analyzing the effects of school vouchers. She's done work on community colleges. And then she has a, a paper, I think this is the most cited yeah, paper. Yeah, I'm sure it is. That, and it's most fun that too. I personally love, <laughs> which is uh, on gender discrimination in orchestra selection. Um, and so it's a terrific paper. Yeah. <laughs> she also has served as the senior editor of the Future of Children journal and editor of the Journal of Labor Economics. Uh, also, there's kind of a family affair phenomenon associated with Princeton. Uh, I, I happen to know that there's a, uh, a, a, a mother and son team at Princeton, uh, uh, Vivian, Viviana Zelizer and her son, Julian Zelizer. But uh, uh, Cecilia Rouse has a sister who's on the faculty at Princeton, Carolyn Rouse, who's in anthropology. Uh, and so uh, there's another family affair that I'm going to mention in a moment, but uh, th thank you very much, Cece, for joining us this evening. Okay. So we're going to have a conversation between Cecilia Rouse and Lisa Cook. Uh, and I first met Lisa, I think, when when you were on your way to doing a master's degree in philosophy at uh, Sheikh Anta Diop University Absolutely. in Senegal, that's right, that's right. you had just finished a Marshall Scholarship mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, a virtual fist bump because I'm also was a exactly, Marshall Scholar. Exactly. Yeah, okay. That's right. That's right. Uh, and and this followed your BA in physics and philosophy from Spelman. Uh, you subsequently, you did a PhD in economics at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and now you're today, you're at Michigan State University. And then most recently, Lisa was the head of the AA Summer Fellowship Program before it mm -hmm. moved to Howard. Mm -hmm. um, I think you began your career as a specialist on Russia. That's this right. is somewhat unusual for, uh, for any economist, <laughs> <laughs> but for a black female economist, it's really, really unusual. And usual is one term. <laughs> <laughs> Early 2000s, she advised the Nigerian government on banking reforms and the government of Rwanda on economic development issues. And in more recent years, her research has moved towards issues in African American history. Some of the most innovative research on the subject, including an analysis of racial violence, patterns of invention and patents, and then with Trevon Logan, who is sitting over there. Wave your hand, Trevon. Thank, <laughs> Thank you. Uh, she has done uh, a substantial amount of work developing a comprehensive and accurate database on lynching in the United States. Uh, now, with respect to the family matter issue, uh, Lisa Cook is the niece of Mrs. Cook, Mrs. Sylvia Cook, and Mrs. Byron. And she is the cousin of Karen Cook. So, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. so it's, it's that Cook family. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, she also f followed Cecilia Rouse as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, I think, immediately after uh, your term of service. Or did the two of you overlap? We, we mm -hmm. didn't overlap, but mm -hmm. I was, she was a member. Yeah, uh, OK. And, and you I were a senior, senior economist. economist. Right. OK, thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so the two of them are going to have a conversation this evening 
and they're going to explore the transition from being an academic economist to an executive branch economist uh, working for the agency that provides the U.S. president with policy advice. Uh, they're going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then we will open the floor for questions and answers. Uh, I, I'm not going to set my alarm, but I am going to watch my, my clock, and uh, I know this is going to be a fascinating conversation. So okay. I'll leave it to the two of you. I look forward to it as well uh, with a chair that's turned the right way. So thank you so much, uh, Cecilia, for joining us. And one thing that we have in common, even before appearing at the Council of Economic Advisors, is that we both studied in Senegal. We did. I, I was um, there when it went from the Université de Dakar. To being shaken university. Oh, right, right, so, right, right, yes. right, right. I was there for and that. She, she, she's, she's doing everything two steps ahead of me. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> so one of the things that I wanted to first talk to you about was because there are so many people here who are in training as uh, people in the academy. So what was it about your research that prepared you as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors and prepared you to be chair. What about your research? <laughs> I don't know. Okay. So let's think about this. Um, so first of all, I went into economics because I, want, I wanted to do policy and I wanted to, to address and think about issues of social policy, unemployment's what really drew me to, was what I was really drawn to. Um, you know, Sandy sort of uh, suggested education's been very important in my family, so understanding the role of education in people's lives. Uh, but I was just interested in poverty. I was always struck by how, what can we be doing to, re to address poverty? So social issues were always what struck me. And I like the framework that economics set up. Um, not that I believed, you know, entirely that our classical model <laughs> you know, solve, you know, you get that equilibrium and the angels sing and, oh, I have the answer. Uh, it's not that I believe that, but I like the thinking about um, prices and wages and, and incentives. Um, you know, there are market failures thinking about, so like, the, I like the way that economics broke down mm -hmm. some of the issues, mm -hmm. so that is a way in to figuring out like what are some ways to mm -hmm. come up with creative solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was interested in an opportunity to apply that in an actual setting, mm -hmm. not just studying it as an academic. Mm -hmm. But I love doing research. I love the classroom. So I was just doing like that thing. Mm -hmm. I got a, an initial call from, I got a call to be a staff economist mm -hmm. at one point, mm -hmm. um, or a senior economist, I'm not sure, along the way. But at Princeton, they but don't- a staff economist at the Council of Economic, economic Advisors. I'm not sure which one it was for. Okay. It was probably staff, because it was okay. early on. I didn't right, have tenure. Right, 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 sure. sure and sure, I sure. didn't want to take the time, because they, Princeton does not automatically stop someone's clock to do mm -hmm. policy work. Mm -hmm. You would think a school of public and international affairs, but we can, that's another conversation for us. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I didn't, I did, and I didn't want to jeopardize that. My heart is in mm -hmm. the academy. Um, you know, I think of myself as an academic that does stints in, in you know, doing mm -hmm. policy, but that goes back to the academy. And so I waited until my packet was in. I had a call from, it started with Larry Summers to be on his team at Treasury, and then the National Economic Council heard, got wind of that and said, how about, you know, come over and join us as a special assistant to the president. Mm -hmm. So I weighed the two, and I decided I really wanted to have the experience of doing the policy the National Economic Council, which coordinates economic policy making around the, the administration, is much more in the mix. Um, and so I went to the NEC. So I did a year at the NEC as a special mm -hmm. assistant. So I had some Washington experience. Right. Um, and so what I would say at the CEA, the CEA is even not, not is one step removed from the policy mix. Mm -hmm. So Bill Spriggs says to me, how come you're here? How come you're not up on the hill counting votes? is because I'm at the CEA. <laughs> and so the Council of Economic Advisors has the luxury of, first of all, mentoring other people. Mm -hmm. But you know, we have conversations, so we are, you know, my team tonight is crashing on some documents that'll be coming out in the next day or two. We have issues we've been crashing on during the day, so we're an input to that policy process. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to be on the Hill counting votes, which I had to do at the NEC. Okay. So what prepared me? Asking good questions. 
-hmm. being willing to learn, being willing to work as a member of a team mm -hmm. because at the Council of Economic Advisors or anywhere mm -hmm. outside of the academy, <laughs> pretty mm -hmm. much, you have to work as a member of a team, yeah. which means you're not always going to win. Right. You know, your right. view is not always going to prevail, mm -hmm. and it probably shouldn't always prevail because there really are many perspectives to any problem. Mm -hmm. um, and so I would say having an open mind, understanding data mm -hmm. really is an important mm -hmm. part of what the CEA brings to uh, you know, its policy work. Mm -hmm. Willing to be objective and uh, uh, and I would say, uh, well, I don't know if this is from the academy, but learning to, to thread a lot of needles. Yes, yes. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, I was invited to, to your point, I was invited to CEA to work on patent reform, and I wound up working on the Eurozone and being there the point go. person on the there Eurozone. You go. So you've got gotta all be the flexible. skills, all gotta the skills. No, you're so right, yeah. you're so right. Um, so what's been the most surprising thing for you as chair. So you remember before. So as chair, who is leading this team of eminent economists, of uh, economists from all over the country, so what's been so uh, the most surprising to you thus far? So I was a member. So the, the CEA has three, technically by the statute, it has three members, one of whom shall be chair. So when it started out, the three members are sort of equal. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I think what they realized that they needed a captain to the ship. And so there was a clarification made later that there would be a chair who would be in charge of the managerial parts of the job. Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, even as dean, right, that's part of being a dean. Mm -hmm. But I would say that has been the biggest difference, mm -hmm. which is mm -hmm. that um, I had to stand up a new CEA. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm willing to say uh, that the transition was not the smoothest transition from the prior mm -hmm. administration, mm -hmm. shall we say. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, uh, there, there, it was a tricky personnel transition. Um, and so having to work through that, mm -hmm. I'm very mm -hmm. proud of the team we've assembled. Mm -hmm. It's a big team. Mm -hmm. uh, we've begged, borrowed, and steal, stolen from many parts of government mm -hmm. in order to mm -hmm. assemble the team. Mm -hmm. We can get people from other parts of the government on detaily, which means we don't mm -hmm. necessarily pay for them. Mm -hmm. So they're for free. And these are phenomenal economists mm -hmm. who bring a, a wonderful perspective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so that has been one. And then two, the other part that I would say is just the range of issues. Mm -hmm. You know, I knew, of, obviously, the CEA deals with a range of economic issues, but I think I didn't appreciate just right. how broad it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I call it skating. When I have to, you know, kind of know mm -hmm. <laughs> something, maybe not at the mm -hmm. depth that, as academics, we're used to, you know, we dig in on a problem and we become the expert on that problem. Mm -hmm. I have to get up to speed very quickly um, so that I can represent the CEA at the principal's level, which is the highest level. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. sort of mm -hmm. learning how to get up to speed quickly, mm -hmm. feeling prepared enough. So my assistant Sahara is here. She's been, it's been a painful, where's Sahara? Oh. There she is. <laughs> so Sahara can vouch for this. So we're all remote. She's got a brand new chair. We don't even have a full team. And how do we develop the processes so that I feel that I have what I need to walk into the meeting mm -hmm, mm -hmm, on mm -hmm. a topic about which I know very little? Right, 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 right. <laughs> so I think that's been one challenge. Well, so thank you for uh, explaining that. And if, because you brought this up, I think it would be useful for people to understand the kinds of jobs that are available at CEA, what people sure. actually do. Because you mentioned staff economists, you mentioned um, besides member and chair, the other positions that are available in case yeah, folks no, might I, be interested. This is perfect. As a matter of fact, just this morning, my team, my chief of staff, and my person who's sort of a deputy chief of staff, that's not literally about that, she's in charge, we had a meeting about hiring. So we are already in the early stages of thinking about next year, so this is the perfect time. Okay, so, so I want you all to, I'm, this is really serious, I want you to think about yourselves and your networks, so here's what we need, here's, here's how we think about it. So we're organized a bit like a university. So there's the chair and two members that I have very little to say about. Uh, but the very important people who support them are senior economists, so like Lisa. So senior economists are typically have tenure uh, at their academic institution, or if they've come from another agency are rather senior economists within their agency. So senior economists, and we need across a range of fields. 
Um, supporting the senior economists, we have staff economists. Staff economists typically are graduate students who take a year out, and I don't like them to do more than a year because they need to go back and finish up. Uh, you know, and we have diversified our team, and I, you know, I am really watching, especially my minority kids mm -hmm. and my women. Like you're not, le you're not staying here forever. There had been mm -hmm. holdovers mm -hmm. from the last administration; We'd been there for years. I'm like, that's not mm -hmm. what we're doing here. Mm -hmm. You're going back to, you're going to finish your PhD because we need you. We need you to be joining your ranks and also to, you know, to join the academy. So the staff economists are usually graduate students that take a year out. Supporting the graduate students, the staff economists, we have research assistants who are typically undergraduates who have just finished up or maybe a year or two out. They, all, they may stay for a, one or two years. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, and they're often then going to apply to, to, to graduate mm -hmm, school. Mm -hmm. I was going to say to PhD programs, which is your, my preferred outcome, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, but just I'm writing a letter for one who's going off to law school. She's mm -hmm. one of our best, actually. Mm -hmm. An African American woman, mm -hmm. she will try to get her back into the fold. Uh, 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 <laughs> She's really one of our best researchers. Uh, so if you know of an undergrad, undergraduates mm -hmm. that are, are finishing up, mm -hmm. um, uh, graduate students that want to take a year in DC, uh, or if you have you yourselves or have colleagues that might be interested at the senior level, please let me know. We're also trying to stand up a paid internship program. It turns out that's harder to do than you'd think. The White House has traditionally had unpaid interns, but we're trying to turn that around. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's really much harder than you work than it looks, but um, we're trying to do that as well. So I have two questions about policy. So uh, thank you for that, that uh, for demystifying the CEA, mm -hmm. because I think that for many people it's a it's a mystery. In terms of the policy formulation process. Arguably, we're in an unprecedented time with respect to uncertainty, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In terms of policy making. Now, uh, you lived in, in Senegal. I work on Russia and on uh, developing countries, on transitional economies in developing countries. I'm used to not having a lot of information. And I'm also used to wild swings in the economy and sudden stops in the economy. But most of our colleagues are not. I mean, and, and especially those that haven't either lived in or worked on uh, developing economies or transition economies. How are you all coping with that? <laughs> how, seriously, how are you, you like, this, is, this, is, this is like um, something that keeps a lot of my economist friends up at night. Like, really? how, yeah, oh yeah. I, like, I, I, you know, maybe I'm just, you know, whistling past my graveyard or something or smoking. So I don't know what, but I feel really confident about what we've been doing. Mm -hmm. Look, mm -hmm. you know, the American Rescue Plan, we had to do that. We're in a, I hate the global pandemic because that seems redundant. We're in mm -hmm. a pandemic mm -hmm. where people, I mean, this is a year and some ago. So, like, you know, we've made progress. But let's just, you know, go back to the way mm -hmm. back machine and remember what it was like even last summer this time. We mm -hmm. didn't have any vaccinations. People could, we could, this wouldn't have been a very safe gathering. Um, people needed to power down their economic activity and their interactions. Mm -hmm. The private sector, you know, parts of it were functioning, mm -hmm. but parts could not function. People still have to pay bills. Uh, you, know, mm -hmm. you know, businesses that, that are viable want to get through, but mm -hmm. if you have too much person-to-person -person contact and had to power down your activities, mm -hmm. what were you going to do? This is exactly when you need a federal government. Oh, yeah. right? And a lot yeah. of state governments have balanced budget requirements, laws. Yeah. So this is when you need a federal government that steps in. So we right. had to do it. So the, you know, the prior administration and the Congress did the first bit. The American Rescue Plan, mm -hmm. which is where you got a hope and a prayer, because by that point, mm -hmm. the vaccines had been developed, but we didn't know how good they were. Mm -hmm. We didn't know if they would reduce transmission. We didn't know how long they would be good for. And we didn't know whether this, you know, the prior administration, OK, I'm just going to be partisan for a minute. I had no confidence that they would be able to distribute it in any real time. Mm -hmm. But the Biden administration, through with the American Rescue Plan, was able to fund the distribution of vaccines. Mm -hmm. um, and then it provided additional support to families and businesses and state and local governments. And, you know, people, <coughs> Larry Summers, um, were saying it was too generous. <coughs> Larry Summers. Um, they said it was too generous at the time that we were going to spark inflation because it was, you know, it was the, the amount of the funding was much bigger than the output gap than he mm -hmm. thought people needed. But that was premised on the economy getting back mm -hmm. by a certain mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. I felt at the time, we're at the mercy of a virus. Mm -hmm. 
We have no idea how effective these vaccines are going to be. We were in a very deep hole, right? We lost millions of jobs, right? Yeah. At the depth, it was yeah. like we were minus 14 million jobs right. or something yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. right? So mm -hmm. we knew that we had like a, a, a big hole to climb out of. So we designed the American Rescue Plan to really spend out through September, which I think we're looking back now and saying, huh, was that even a little short, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So, um, it, but, it, but at a minimum, we know that the state and local governments, which even you know, a month or two ago, people thought was too generous, but guess what? Those states still need some funding to ensure that they can open schools safely because we're not through this yet. They know they're gonna need some states in particular, you know, some states uh, where uh, people are re rejecting the vaccine, which means we're getting to this weird political mm -hmm. space actually, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. where states where they're rejecting the vaccines are needing the additional aid. And so it's becoming a bit of a tension between the vaccinated and unvaccinated. But, but the point is we're not done with this. Mm -hmm. And so the American Rescue Plan, I feel like was what we needed to do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about inflation. Right, so we're seeing inflation. We get a new CPI reading on Wednesday. Not that anybody's thinking about it at the CEA. Oh no, we're not focused on that. Not, not, so, not at all. Um, <laughs> so, you know, we've got inflation that we haven't had. The Fed has actually welcomed some inflation. Mm -hmm. It's been yeah, very sure. low. Yeah. Um, I don't think we see any evidence, and you know, I'm not saying it's not there at all, but we, we're not seeing evidence it's because of the American Rescue Plan. Mm -hmm. I see it's evidence of having had an economy that was powered down and that we're getting started mm -hmm. back together. You know, businesses liquidated their inventories. Mm -hmm. You can't just wave a magic wand and have your inventories mm -hmm. back up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You gotta rebuild them. Okay, but the people who make every widget and screw and thing that you ha have to make your, mm -hmm. your widget, uh, <laughs> you know, they've got people who were sick and they're coming from places where COVID is still out of control. You know, I think it's just, we're, mm -hmm. we're just putting this economy back together. Yeah. And that largely the inflation is from supply chains. Yes, some of it is that demand came back much faster than supply was able to come mm -hmm. back. I think this is going to be the perfect neoclassical example of when you have a shortage on one side, mm -hmm. a price will adjust, whether it's wages or prices, mm -hmm. and that over time, that mm -hmm. works itself out. Mm -hmm. So I don't As it did it. at the beginning of the pandemic. As it did at the beginning yeah, of yeah, the pandemic. Yeah, exactly. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, 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 so yeah, I, yeah. I'm not losing sleep over this part. Right, right, right. And then, you know, we've got some, you know, what we're trying to pass, the reason why, you know, Bill, really, you should be up on the hill so you can report back to us. Um, uh, <laughs> the Senate is trying to pass the infrastructure part of the President's Build Back Better, um, mm -hmm. you know, plan, which is physical infrastructure. Uh, and so the Senate is trying to pass that. Mm -hmm. And then they're trying to vote on the $3.5 trillion. Sometimes I'm like, do you say billion? No, 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 trillion dollars. Um, uh, which is really investment in human capital. Mm -hmm. It's really, that's where we see, you know, home, uh, home health care, mm -hmm. universal pre-K, mm -hmm. uh, the co higher education supports, mm -hmm. um, and other investments in human capital. So okay. I think, you know, I think it's all, all very important and all that's forward looking and really meant to be putting us on a better path going forward. Mm -hmm. right. right. So right. I hate to intervene, but, but I you're think it's time. time for question and answers. And so I'd like to ask people who have questions to please come to the microphone and, uh, and, and, and raise your concerns, issues, or ideas. Hi. I'm um, Linda Bale of Co College of Staten Island. I'm interested in education, of particularly math education. And I, I always am baffled by the funding model, which is, we you know, uh, the, the uh, red, so, so People couldn't get loans, I guess, in certain areas. This, the tax base funds the schools. And then so we know that there's wide disparities in the funding of different school districts. Teachers are on GoFundMe trying to get things for their mm -hmm. class. It's mm -hmm. not working out if you don't have the parental, you know. So is there any conversation about funding education so that these teachers are not you know, so basically funding education in a different way. Is that conversation happening? Um, uh, I wouldn't say that conversation is happening in this White House at this time, because that's going to the very heart of how we've organized our K through 12 educational system, which is it's, you know, it starts at the local level. So that what, 90% of the funding for K through 12 is at the state and local level. We believe in local control uh, which means, you know, there's a mind boggling variation in how schools <laughs> districts go about doing things across this country. We've got 15,000 school districts. Um, 
So uh, that is a really good question, don't get me wrong. I personally think that additional centralization in this country of K through 12 would be advantageous because what happens is kids, especially kids who, um, you know, lower income kids where the houses, they're moving houses mm -hmm. throughout the year, they can, their school year is completely disruptive when they go from one mm -hmm. district to another, mm -hmm. um, even from one school to another, that the teachers are not following, you know, curricula that are aligned and so they completely drop and you see the, the massive disparities in funding. You know, states have narrowed some of those disparities, but um, you know, that, is, that goes to the very heart of how we do K through 12 education. Um, so this president is taking on many big issues. He hasn't chosen to take this one on, especially mm -hmm. since the current role of the federal government here is not very large. Um, hello, Ed, you can take this question, I guess, however you want to, and I can make it more specific and less general. But um, I was recently talking to another economist who is now uh, a delegate in, in the state and, and had this conversation. But the summary is, what's one thing that you think academic economists can do better and improve in interacting with the policy process? And what's something that we're doing that is good? Something, you know, a good thing, a bad thing and a good thing if you want to do it. Or if you can do it to me more of one or the other, that's also fine. Okay, as, and it's an excellent question actually. So I will say that, that you know, even at the CEA, we rely on you all to have the time to focus in and to, um, to one, have the time to, to see, think ahead, and we rely on your creativity and innovation to be thinking of problems before they develop, mm -hmm. right? That's mm -hmm. what we do as academics, is we follow our nose, and we hope we've got good noses, right, to follow good <laughs> sense. Um, but we rely on you guys seeing things before we do, because you're playing with data, um, you're analyzing data and you're getting new insights that we may not have seen. You also have more time to, to and we have confidence you have more time to get it right. Um, you know, my team is analyzing data all the time, but it's really helpful when we can rely on an academic study yeah. because it brings an imprimatur that is just really helpful. Um, so that is something that you're, you know, that's, that's great. And it's always helpful if you're willing to talk to us too when we call. So I, I just put that out there. Not that anyone has ever said that. Um, things that could be more helpful is to, you know, and the, the, I, I say this with a little bit of hesitation because I recognize there are 24 hours in the day. You have to prioritize. And if you do too much of what I'm about to say, you won't be able to do what I just said as well. <laughs> and so I do want to, you know, sort of calibrate this. But um, we were talking to some researchers at a think tank that wanted to be helpful. And they were addressing, they were asking the right question, but not quite drilling down and looking at it from the perspective of, okay, so then what is the implication for, you know, how does this really tie mm -hmm. into, and pulling it to the next mm -hmm. level mm -hmm. so that someone can take the result and, know, and can do something with it without having to become an expert in whatever it was. Mm -hmm. So it, it, re it requires being a little bit more attuned to what the actual debate is at the time on the particular issue so that you know where your research fits in or doesn't fit in. Um, you know, mostly though, I suggest you follow your own nose when it comes to research. It's, it's my own view is you, you're gonna do your best research when you're working on issues and topics that you're most excited about mm -hmm. because then you'll have the tenacity to carry it through. You'll remain engaged in carrying it through, which means you'll do your best work and let the chips fall where they may because eventually the policy world will catch up. If they don't, that's our loss. Uh, but I think eventually they do. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. But it's got to be based on really top-rate research, and I think you do that when you follow your nose and, and, and follow your own convictions. Mm -hmm. Okay, Anusha. So, um, Anusha Chari from UNC Chapel Hill. Um, kudos for the infrastructure plan and bringing it as far as it has come. Um, I just want to add a question about rural America and whether there is, you know, what is the thinking? Is there a plan in the works for reviving rural America? So, um, so it's, thank you, that's a great question. People say to me, well, you know, as chair of the CEA, what are you doing for equity and diversity? And, and I say, yes, yes, and all, you know, I care a lot, but I will say two things. One is when I think of diversity, I think of not just by race, I think of about a lot of different differences, including urban-rural. 
And the other thing I say is, as much as we all have it bad, Native Americans have it worse. And so, and they intersect with both being a, you know, a severely underrepresented minority and living in rural America. So we have, for example, at the CEA, we have had, we had a DTLE from USDA and we have a new one. And I'm just gonna give you, oh, I can't actually reveal what she's, because I can't tell you what we did yet. It's not public. But she just did some, like, literally. Cliffhanger. Cliffhanger, literally, she single-handedly, like, got extra resources for Native Americans. I mean, I almost want to cry just, um, just from an insight that she saw in something we were doing. Um, and so I, you know, I, so this administration is very focused on trying to address rural America. I can tell you, Secretary Vilsack, in any meeting I'm in, he's like, and rural America, and the farmers, and don't forget rural America, and he's good. I have to say, he's good at making sure his issues stay on the table. Mm -hmm. But we at the CEA are focused on it. We intentionally wanted somebody from USDA for exactly this reason, because I think we have to, you know, we have to be paying attention to not just our urban centers, which are so important, but rural America. And, you know, there's also the political imperative that if we think, you know, I personally think that is part of what, um, you know, the Obama administration dropped the ball on. And I will, I will just say that forthright, having been a member of the administration. I think they weren't focused enough on the fact that many of our policies have done more for urban America than they've done for the vast middle. So I've got a couple of questions. Okay. okay. Uh, the first one is, could you comment on what steps are being taken or should be taken to cope with the imminent eviction crisis? And the second question concerns whether or not inflation is inevitable in a situation in which we maintain people's incomes or try to maintain people's incomes when we don't have the capacity to maintain production. Uh, and so Gosh, have we run out of time? Notice I didn't ask you those questions. Inflation has come on delay. It didn't happen immediately. And so I'm just wondering, yeah. is no. it something that had yeah, no, to no. ultimately happen? Okay, right? so let's yeah. do the eviction, the eviction crisis first, which is you know, this administration is focused on it. Um, the, I, as of 6.30 tonight at our checkout meeting, the judge had not ruled in the hearing of the latest, you know, version of the moratorium. So I don't, they, that was interpreted as a good news, but we will see. Um, you know, governors and uh, mayors are sitting on, I forget what was it, $40 billion um, from the American Rescue Plan in rental aid. Um, you know, it's a little, it's a mystery to some as to why it hasn't been distributed. Some of the governors are, are saying that, you know, they don't want to cooperate. Yeah. Um, this is purely political. And so, you know, I'm not sure what the, what Congress and the Biden administration, we have, I mean, just to tell you the team that's working on this, if the name Gene Sperling means anything to people, yeah. you know they've got the right guy on it. Because Gene Sperling, he was director of the National Economic Council. I worked for him. He then, uh, that was under Clinton, he then eventually became uh, director of the NEC under Obama as well. He's like a guy who works 24 seven, is uh, like tenacious as all get out, knows where the bodies are buried, knows how to get things done. And so he is very focused on implementation of the American Rescue Plan and has been on this. But that's what we're trying to do on this side. It's part, but it's, you know, I don't know what to say, Sandy. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's gonna, it's. Yeah, it's partisan politics. It's partisan politics. Yeah. Um, but the implications are so large. Oh, they're huge. They're huge. Yeah, they're, they're, they're huge. absolutely huge. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, I mean, the it's, good news is we have things like the child tax credit, which are coming out. So there are these income supports. And there's still, you know, our SNAP benefits are continue to be 50. You know, so there are other supports for families. Uh, but I don't, I don't mean to, yeah. I'm just saying that we yeah. can do what we can do. We're working on it. Okay. okay. Um, on the, on the inflation question, I think this is a real question. You know, the, the, the Biden agenda, if you look at Build Back Better and if you look at the, um, the infrastructure part, the Build Back Better part, which includes the expansion um, of the child tax credit to make it fully refundable, which is a huge income support. That's a really a child, a child allowance. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, expansion of EITC um, and other, you know, home health workers and trying to improve their wages. So the, the efforts to really improve 
um, wages and living conditions and living standards for, our, for the poorest. So from the president's perspective, in our view, if you look at the components of Build Back Better, it's not only meant to be redistributing to those who have the least incomes, but it's also meant to be investing in human capital and physical capital and innovation so that we actually have some additional economic growth, mm. which should allow us to absorb um, you know, this increased um, aggregate, <coughs> aggregate demand. So that's the premise. Even Larry Summers has said he agrees with this. <laughs> so, um, so the long well, that might be even a bad Larry, side. it could be a bad side. Uh, yeah. No, uh, but but the point is that I think that I think that these longer term investments in the in our bigger policies are are are, are more are sound. In the shorter term, though, you know that is why we had aggregate demand able to come back mm -hmm. a lot faster than supply. Yeah. And that is that is the very source of the the inflation that we're seeing that we that you know by all you know by all metrics to date so you know things change, but it, as far as we can see, it really is about supply chain disruptions. Mm -hmm. You know when we look at so when we look at last month's CPI, a large part of it was in transportation. Those are the autos mm -hmm. where you have semiconductor mm -hmm. shortages, and that's real and. Just as one, and how micro you get on this stuff. So yeah. there was a plant in Malaysia that had to shut down because of a COVID outbreak a week or two ago. And that caused Ford or GM to have to shut down a manufacturing plant for two days mm -hmm. for every one day that that plant was down. So, you know, COVID had, and our auto manufacturers short-sighted, they were short-sighted in their shipment ordering last year because they didn't know when we were gonna get back on our feet. They didn't know when demand was gonna come back, but there's such a lead in the chip manufacturing and the orders, when they, when they reduced their orders, chip manufacturers redistributed to other, other electronics that need mm -hmm. chips. Um, and so the car manufacturers are at the back of the line and you can't build a new you know, chip plant mm -hmm. in 90 days. Mm -hmm. you know, it takes like a year and a half to build it. So th these mm -hmm. are, you know, the supply is rather inelastic in some ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, who's to the blame there? It's, part, it's, I, I, it's a new field, pandemic economics. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's, it's, we, we haven't been through this. It's, you know, like really understanding just when you power down and you're at the mercy of a virus and what, that, what the implication is for us and the rest of the world. We've looked at our inflation in comparison to other countries. It's hard. But as far as we can compare apples to apples, as our inflation looks a little higher, when you take out the autos, it looks pretty similar. Mm. So, autos and fuel, or fuel we usually take out anyway because right, it's kind yeah, of yeah, you know yeah, it's kind so, of variable. right, right, but, right. But yeah. I think that's still that, that's really driving a lot. It, of it is. Yeah, it depends yeah, on yeah, the no. month. Yeah, it yeah, depends no, on which right, month yeah. you look at. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. No. That's so. very volatile. Run, Cece. being here. Thank you so much for being here. So I will say, because this is, you know, the diversity initiative for tenure and economics, and Cece Ross was also the chair of the Committee on the Status of Minority Groups in the Economics Profession when take I was... Take a breath, and you have to take a breath. Yes, <laughs> when I was, yeah, when I was on it as well. I was lucky enough to be on it then. And um, so I'm going to ask for your views, your long view on diversity in economics and what we in this room can do and what the whole profession can do uh, to increase the representation of underrepresented minority groups writ large. And we'll just throw in women in there as well. But definitely everyone in this room, um, but I know you see all the intersectionality as well. So yeah, um, yeah. You know, Thank it's you. so easy. If we yeah. would just, I love it when people have policy ideas, if you would just, and then I already know, okay. Uh, uh. You know, for our, I mean, this is a problem. <laughs> so, Sandy, I remember when you started Dite. Yeah. It was like, what, six people in a room? I you were what? I'm just saying, it started so small, and look at what you've built. Right? Well, I mean, seriously. Well, just, just, just thank you, but uh, the first cohort was more than six people in a room. Okay, I know. <laughs> you, come on. You have to go, roll yeah. with me, roll with me. <laughs> thank you. My point is, my point is, I think, I think that organizations like Dite and, you know, SEMGEP, I think, has been very important, um, is we have to take care of one another, and we have to look for opportunities to mentor our students. I think we have to encourage young people, this starts early, 
to try out economics and to see that it's more than just stocks and bonds and whatever you might see on CNBC or read about in the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal sometimes can get a little bit into interesting questions. But that people can address many, many questions using the tools of economics. And that the tools of economics are not monolithic. We can look at this, uh, us, the three of us mm -hmm. up here and say, we approach questions very differently, but we can address interesting questions um, with our training. And I, I personally think that that is the biggest gift we can give to young people is to encourage them to the economics class mm -hmm. and to see, to see that. Now, of course, it's incumbent upon us teaching to teach it in a way that's also interesting and doesn't just you know, talk about guns and butter. <laughs> um, uh, as the two as the two goods, but um, I, I think that it starts there. But I, I believe very strongly in the mentorship. So you know, just again, just from my little stupid perch from the CEA, there was a, a young woman coming out of Harvard uh, who's going to be on the job market, who was interested in joining the CEA. The CEA, you know, Biden. Everybody's interested in joining Biden, and I said, I'm not going to take her. Mm. She needs to go on the job market, and she needs to keep going. Like, this is not the right time for her to do this. Her academic life will be long. But she was like literally on the job market. She sh and she had had time off, you know, doing the pre-doc, pro-doc. I mean, you know, the, 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 t the track has gotten long. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, she needed to get started in her professional career. And so I keep that in mind. I won't take someone who I think coming to the CEA is the, it's the wrong time for them to do it, mm -hmm. just because I know that the CEA would be better off for having them. Mm -hmm. I know that their lives are long, they can come at a different time. So I think it's really important that we help people focus on what's important for them, which we know is for them to become economists. And so we just happen to know that. Okay, that was a joke. You can all laugh about that. <laughs> but my point is to help people, you know, help our help students really come along and seeing the value in economics. But it's a slow game, right? There are many things that people can do with their lives, and economics is but one thing. Um, and uh, so I, you know, I want people to do to follow their passion, if that takes them into law or mm -hmm. engineering or some other field. I, you know, I will always support them with that because I think we want we need talented black people, women, Native Americans, Hispanics. You know, we need talented people doing everything. At the, doing everything. Right. So I am, you know, I, I'll take the economist very well, but mostly mm -hmm. I think it's helping young, these young people find what really excites them and where they're gonna do their best work and be fulfilled as people, right? Because that's fundamentally what we aspire for them. Mm -hmm. So I think we have time for two more questions. Okay, so one is coming from Guy Numa. Guy Numa, Colorado State University. Um, I have a tough question. Okay, <laughs> bring it on. That is the right forum for that. I'm sure you read uh, Kirsten and Sandy's book on reparations. Uh, can you honestly address this? Do you think something can be done? What can you do in your current position? Uh, it's been done in other countries. Yes, thank you. So I actually haven't read your book, Sandy. Okay. I'm gonna, I'm gonna okay. can, I, got, I have to cop to that. Like you have lots of time. I now, have right? lots yeah. of time. Um, I've, read, you know, I've read snippets around, but I haven't had a chance to read the book. Um, look, I, the thing that I, that, I didn't think I was going to go back into government after my last stint. I really didn't. I was very happy being dean and doing the academic thing. In Washington, you know, you know it's, it's an honor to contribute to the policy debate, but it's a rough place. And I'm an academic at heart, so I like, I like mentoring my students, I like doing research, and I, liked, I loved being dean of SPIA. So I didn't think I was going to come back. But this was a president and an administration, so his team, that I felt there, this was a moment. I felt their priorities were really in the right place and where I thought we could make some progress on some naughty, really important questions. Um, so, I, so I came. Uh, it, racial inequality, discrimination, um, and the black-white wealth gap, the black-white income gap, uh, was among the issues that I feel this administration is really devoted to. Um, that said, how we do it, I'm, I don't know that I have the answer. I know Sandy feels he has the answer, and I think it's an important uh, you know, I, it's an important idea that's on the table. Um, I have to say it's not the one that I'm spending my time on. I'm happy to hear about it, and I want it to be in the mix because I think we have to make progress on this. Um, but I think that there are a lot of ways that we, which we can try to address this. This is, you know, discrimination in the history of black people is not going to be solved with one single thing. I don't, you know, and, I don't know. You, do you really say reparations would solve everything? No. Never okay. Said thank that. you. Okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Because it's there, such there, a big. There are all problem. kinds of things people accuse us of saying in the book, but 
Th that's not that we them. never said. Right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, the, the problem is this is such an endemic big problem that we need all hands on deck. We need all ideas at the table, and they should all be c given serious consideration. So I think that should be part of the mix. Um, I myself uh, do work in education, uh, and you know we know housing is a huge one. Uh, we have uh, we've been doing some work on the economic impacts of the voting rights, um, and uh, you know so you know ensuring that everybody has access to democracy is a really big part of this too. Like there's so many components to it that that that's what I think is most important. Yeah. That's good. Monica. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Um, probably you have a very busy schedule. Um, um, I'm thinking of um, how uh, you see in policy how or where you are at this moment. Uh, different voices are incorporated in the discussion, and how uh, that ha is different from your academic background. And what would you bring from the experience that you're gaining right now, if there is any? You will bring back that back into academia when you're back to academia, if there anything learned. Um, and it, this is like the conversation of what maybe would be too harsh in the checking the boxes of, oh, we have this representation here, but what exactly voice, voices we're hearing and what it, how they translate into policy, like what are the really spaces and how the discussions start in politics or in policy where you are at and what you will bring back to academia. See, mine went the other way. Uh -huh. I would say that I really learned to value talking to lots of different people when I was at the National Economic Council, because that's what my job required me to do. Lobbyists would come talk to me and lobby me on something uh, or whatever, so I would hear from different perspectives. You know, They all were interested in their own way, but I got to hear their very different perspectives. When I got to the National Economic Council, uh, one of my very first meetings was uh, on H-1B visas. Uh, Elena Kagan came flying into the room. That's what my recollection was. Literally, she was just off of a plane from Florida. She was the deputy at the Domestic Policy Council. And there was a New York Times article that had, where someone had leaked that, that the administration was considering raising the cap. Mm -hmm. She was furious that it had been leaked. And she said, OK, now I guess we have to get to work and figure out what we want to do. It was the little issue that could for me. I worked, so I was there at that first meeting. And I stuck, Gene Sperling thought this was a good issue for the president, so I stuck with this. I got to negotiate on the Hill. But in that process, I had to work across Department of Labor, don't raise the cap. Department of you know, <laughs> Treasury, raise the cap. <laughs> Commerce, raise the cap. You know, so I got to hear all sides and try to work out how are mm -hmm. we going to come up with an administration position that reflected the various um, uh, constituencies within the administration. And it, we ended up with a Franken bill, I have to admit, and that was not implementable, but anyway. But I learned a lot about listening to people. Gene Sperling always said you're gonna roll somebody, because whenever you make a decision, not everybody can be happy, that you just can't operate that way. Um, but if I ever hear that you didn't listen to somebody, that's when your head will roll. And so I learned that there, and as dean, that's how I operated all the time. I had to hear from every interested party I couldn't necessarily act on what everybody wanted because you can't do that. But I had to hear from everybody and I continue that to this day. I'm a huge believer in, di in diversity of thought. Um, my students at SPIA were not happy with me for that. I believe in having conservatives. I thought at SPIA, we have to have conservative voices. How can you do public policy if you don't recognize that other, not everybody thinks the way that you do? And so um, I believe in having many voices at the table uh, because I know that I don't see everything, and I know that people's lived experiences bring something, people's you know, academic whatever, whatever it is that they're bringing, that having lots of viewpoints around the table means we'll come up with a better solution, mm -hmm. a, better, a better answer. So I'm really comfortable in that space, um, and, but I think it came more from my experience at the NEC than from academia, actually. Well, thank you very, very much. OK, I have one last thing I'm going to say. Please do. Okay, we talked all of this about policy. But here's what I'm going to say is don't get diverted. For those of you who are so diversity in, this is about tenure. Yes. Get tenure first. That's what I'm going to say is like, you know, there, did we go back to the 24 hours in a day? 
Once you have tenure, you can do whatever you want, okay? <laughs> but first you have to get tenure. Well now, I've said something different about okay. that. Okay, all right. <laughs> I, I have said that if you won't do it before you have tenure, you won't do it after oh, you get tenure. Oh, I disagree with you. I actually disagree with that. I think there's 24 hours in the day, and if you want to, you should first focus on the papers. I think it's hard to, especially like, you know, I'm not gonna play the gender card, okay. So I, I just, you know, like we have busy lives, and if you get distracted from do, for doing the policy work, you're not gonna write the best research and you're just jeopardizing the tenure. Once you have tenure, you have that for life. And you, then you can spend the time, you know, then if you spend some time doing policy, that's like, no, that's not Well, gonna... but there's always another target, right? To become a full professor or to become a distinguished professor. Yeah, no, but and you gotta people... get tenure first. Well, no, I understand that. <laughs> but I'm just saying that, <laughs> that if, if you don't do these things because you're afraid about the political backlash in your department, you will always be afraid about well, the political backlash. Oh, that's it. Wait, I didn't say that. Okay. I'm talking about spending time with the CEA doing stuff oh, that influences okay, the okay. policy world. Okay, okay. Yeah, no, okay. I doubt All right, so that. we're in agreement. Okay, we're in agreement. <laughs> yeah, no, my point is that you got to stay focused on getting tenure. And then, you you know, that's like probably the worst thing about the academy because really it's probably inefficient as an organization but as academics and as intellectuals it gives you the freedom and the time to then really can to give back but first you got to get tenure and so I, I and that's just a short clock we're right. talking like five six right. seven years right. but I, I I mean I offer a caveat because I didn't do that I showed up at CE before I got tenure but I was also following my nose Right, I, I, I was convinced that the profession was wrong about my work, okay? <laughs> so I just kept doing my work as you had uh, encouraged me to do, as Sandy encouraged me to do. Um, and I think because our noses, uh, we trust our noses and we learn yeah. to trust our noses, yeah, trust um, eventually uh, we will lead somebody to the light or planet money will discover you. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> well, well, this, this, this is the community of uh, fellows for the diversity initiative for tenure in economics. Exactly. And so, so of course, right. we're deeply committed to you getting Absolutely. 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 It's Absolutely. awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank Thanks you. so much. You're yeah. very welcome. Thank you, Stacey. You're welcome. <laughs> And I just want to publicly thank Cece and Sandy for being my mentors throughout the profession. So I am in heaven right now. Oh, wow. Thank you so much, both of you. Thank you. Thanks. Right. Good job. Thank you, Cece. Elbow it out. Okay, that was fun. Okay. Sorry. Uh, Cece, don't, uh, don't go away. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. I was just going to slink. I, I think we have to follow uh, oh, Sandy. Am I supposed we to? should follow Sandy. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we have a gift for you. Oh my goodness, what is this? This is a copy of the Emancipation oh, Proclamation. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yes. From, from the wow. National Archives. Yeah. 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 Wow. So it's a little bit heavy, but <laughs> we thought you'd want. Oh, oh, sorry, people couldn't hear me. Can you hear me now? He, he turned me off. This is from the <laughs> Emancipation Proclamation <laughs> from the National Archives. This is our gift wow. to the 30th yes. chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, Cecilia wow. Ritz. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And forgive me for not lugging this home, because I have to walk home. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get it to We'll work it out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You know what? Keep, yeah. Oh, yeah. I was going to awesome. say. Wait, where's the home? Okay. Right. Thank you. Thank you. No, seriously, thank you. Yeah. I'd love to hang this at the CEA.